Now you know that when you hear the word radiation just generally in life, we're not talking about any old radiation, we're talking about the bad radiation. We're talking about alpha, beta and gamma, aren't we? Maybe x-rays as well. Why are they bad? Well, it's because they carry so much energy with them that they can excite electrons out of atoms, so therefore ionizing atoms or molecules, and that can cause damage to your cells, especially if it's absorbed by DNA. It's no different here. When we're talking about medical uses of radiation, we're not talking about MRI, which uses radio frequency photons. No, we're talking about using pretty much gamma radiation. The first thing that we can use radiation for in medicine is as a tracer. We have a source that is bound to either water or glucose. It's either injected into the bloodstream or it's swallowed. It depends on what you're trying to see. And there's a few main sources that we use. Technetium-99, and that's in a metastable state. Iodine-131 and indium-111. Technetium, because it's in the metastable state, that means that the nucleus is in an excited state after having been made from molybdenum going through beta decay. Indium-131, that releases gamma, but it also emits beta-2. And indium just emits gamma photons as well. That's because it decays by electron capture. So electrons go into it, not come out of it. Now, what are the half-lives of these sources? We don't want them to be too short because otherwise you won't be able to do a scan. We also don't want them to be too long because otherwise they're going to stay in someone's body for a long time, and that's no good. Technetium has a half-life of about six hours. Iodine 131, eight days, and indium, nearly three days. Now we call these the physical half-lives. That's the normal half-life, what we're used to. Technetium is sort of like a good all-rounder isotope. It's used as a tracer a lot. Iodine 131, because the thyroid in your body uses iodine, it's used as a tracer to see what's happening with a person's thyroid. Indium is usually used in blood to see what's going on with blood cells and antibodies. Now the thing is, once you put an isotope into somebody, your body will immediately start trying to get rid of it. And so this half-life isn't going to be quite right. So we have an equation that takes this into account. These are all half-lives. Like we said, we have the physical half-life. That's these ones here. This is TB, the biological half-life. That's all to do with how quickly your body gets rid of it. And if we combine the reciprocals of those, we get one over the effective half-life. And so that one is the true indication of how the activity of an isotope is going to change in your body over time. Now, because technetium has a very, very short half-life, this process needs to be done in hospitals because you're never going to get it somewhere in six hours. It's not going to be much use anyway. So we do this with a molybdenum technetium generator. How does that work? Well, we take molybdenum and we combine it with aluminium oxide that makes the molybdenum decay into technetium and the technetium 99M is washed out with saline. That's just salt water. And then you can just inject that solution straight into a patient ready to go as a tracer. So once you have this, well, let's go with gamma source in your body, these gamma photons are going to start streaming out of your body. And because gamma has high penetrative ability, that means that most of it is going to go out of you without being absorbed. It can cause damage, but it's probably worth the risk in order to find out how to fix a bigger problem in your body. So the question is, how do we then detect these gamma rays? Well, we just call it a gamma camera. First thing we have is a lead collimator that only lets gamma through. So that's going to stop other radiation like alpha and beta from spoofing the camera. And of course, we're going to have a big casing of lead as well around the outside of the camera to stop any gamma getting in from other sources as well. So we want the gamma to come in from this direction. And so we have a thick case on the outside. Next thing we have is a crystal. And that's a sodium iodide crystal. What happens is a gamma photon will go in and then that will turn it into visible photons. You'll have a little flash of light. Then what we have are photomultiplier tubes. They basically take light and convert it into energy for electrons. It's basically the photoelectric effect. And then we have a lot of fancy electronics in here. And then that takes the signal out to the computer to then be processed. Building up an image using gamma photons going into the different bits of the camera. PET scanning or positron emission tomography. So on the face of it, it kind of looks similar to an MRI scanner. 
you've got the person and let's say that they've got their head in the scanner because that's what we're scanning. The patient is injected with a positron emitting isotope, something like nitrogen 13 or oxygen 15. Generally, they have too few neutrons. When positrons are emitted, they don't survive very long. Why? Well, it's because they're going to come across an electron sooner or later, usually sooner. So a positron meets an electron and they should remember this from first year they annihilate and you know that when you have an electron and a positron annihilating or anything annihilating for that matter they produce two photons that go off in opposite directions these photons are detected at the ring and then you can produce an image from these. Now this is good at building up an image, a 3D image of what's going on inside your body, but it does use gamma radiation. It's gamma photons that are produced by the annihilation. And so it's not considered as safe as MRI. It's still really expensive. So what is the advantage of a PET scanner over MRI? Well, the really good thing about these is that the positron emitter ends up being concentrated at points in your body where metabolism is high or fast. And again, that's because glucose is used, just like we saw earlier. So you might have cells that are metabolizing, they're respiring very, very quickly, too quickly, and growing out of control. And so you can see where they are. What is that? You can identify tumors using this. If you see a bright spot where lots of gamma photons are coming from in your body, that's because there's lots of metabolism going on there, and so chances are that cancer has formed there. Once you've identified that there might be a tumor in your body, well, you could perform surgery, but that's dangerous, and it might not get rid of it completely. So what else can you do? Well, you can use radiation to combat that too. Let's say that somebody is unfortunate enough to have a cancerous growth in their brain. What you can do is use x-rays, or gamma rays to destroy cancerous cells. Yes, you can use this radiation to damage cancerous cells, but it can damage healthy cells as well. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your beam is gonna be focused. And so you don't have just a straight beam going in, a parallel beam. You have a focused beam that meets right where the tumor is. That means that even though all of the radiation is going into your head, it is more spread out before and after the tumor. So that means that the chances of something bad happening is reduced. Of course, another thing you can do is rotate the source. If we rotate it around, that means again that every healthy part of your brain gets a limited dose of radiation. Last thing that you can do, similar to traces, you can inject or place a beta emitter next to the tumor. We know that beta packs more of a punch than gamma, and so putting that right next to a tumor will cause it a heck of a lot of damage. Again, it's a possibility that it could cause damage to the healthy cells next to it, but like we said, with a lot of these things, the risk is worth it. So that's a bunch of different ways that radiation, or rather ionizing radiation, is used in medicine. I hope that's been useful. If it has been, then please leave a like. If you have any comments or questions, put them down below. And I'll see you next time.